I'm Tony Doherty and welcome to a very special week of Max's Muscle TV. Tonight is the last episode in our series, folks, but you'll be really glad to know we're going out with a bang. If you're a fan of bodybuilding now, or particularly in the 80s or 90s, you'll recognise the name Rocco Apetisano. Rocco's story is an incredible one. As a kid from the wrong side of the tracks, who not only became a top bodybuilder himself, but also built a federation and an empire around the sport he loves, while grooming and inspiring some of the biggest and best names in the business in an era when the sport was still in its infancy. We're very proud to share his story with you tonight, and we know you'll love it. It's his story in his words. Rocco Petisano, a true pioneer in Australian bodybuilding. Came to Australia from Italy, a ship, me and my brother, Vince. We were only three years old when we settled in Brooklyn. Then we came down to, uh, my father bought a house in Railway Street in Footscray. Wasn't in a good location. We had a railway in the back, but uh, we were happy there. Then later, uh, we had three more children, two more brothers and a sister. We weren't well off. My father's job didn't pay too much. You know, all I know is uh, we were always hungry and no one was around. We rarely saw our mother. My father was always working. So we were pretty much left to ourselves. We got up to a lot of no good. Me, mother and father were always fighting each other and uh, we were actually brought up just seeing fights, all of us. Many times the neighbours called the police. We must have been the most feral family in the entire neighbourhood. <laughs> Me, mother and father had a split. The courts awarded me with my father and the other four with my mother. So I lived with my father. Now, my father was never home. He, he's always worked, so I was pretty much uh, on my own. Now, the problem uh, with my father, he never used to dress me well. He used to always give me uh, clothing that was much bigger. So I go to school dressed weirdly. I was a skinny kid, so obviously I was a bully target. At first, I didn't like the bullying. And uh, somehow, you know, me being bullied was a form of fun. I got attention, you know. I felt special being bullied. I started to enjoy it. So when they bullied me, I uh, did some bad stuff to ensure I get more bullied. And oh boy, I was bullied. It got to the stage where it was 14 or 15 after me, always fighting and running and winning. And of course, I'd become too good as a fighter. Too many people got hurt under my hands. Then they stopped. And then I started making friends. And it got to the stage where I started helping other people being bullied, you know, little weirdos and nerds, anyone different, and they'd all become my friend. Then they started giving me their lunch, food, and good tasting food. And I go, that was a motivation, you know, they're giving me lunch, they're giving me apple, some will give me small change. And it meant a lot because we were so hungry, you know, me and my poor old brother Vince, you know, we were known around Footscray, uh, stealing fruit from trees and we're used to getting stoned and hosed and all sorts of stuff, you know. So uh, someone giving you their lunch and a, a good tasting lunch, that was everything to me at the time. They made me what I am and, and it become good in the end and it become empowering, it, it was enjoying. I got a reputation all over Footscray. Uh, you know, no one will mess with me anymore. Me and a friend wanted to learn martial arts. You know, just for the sake of it, I figured, hey, if, uh, uh, you know, just for something to do, just to keep fit. We went into this martial arts studio in a city owned by Mighty Apollo. He was a strong man. We used to pull trams with his teeth, one of the highest martial arts men in its time. Uh, he was a bodybuilder himself, a boxer. He was everything. Yeah, I, I, I had a lot of respect for him. So, you know, we went into the gym and we saw a great big sign uh, uh, up in there, Mighty Apollo's Martial Arts Centre. And it was a good coincidence because we, we didn't realise we stumbled on the best. While I'm there learning martial arts, I kept praising these uh, paintings on his wall of bodybuilders. 
they're the ultimate. They're the real trainer. They're the real fighters. And I go, why is Apollo praising these guys all the time? I think I want to be one. I bought a couple of magazines in the news agents, and there was programs there. So I started a program. I joined the gym, 60-something kilos, still skin and bone. I was 19. I started a three-day-a-week program, and then I started watching all the big boys train. I noticed the biggest had one style of training. You know, they didn't lock out their reps. And I figured I'd duplicate them. I was sick of being skinny. I wanted that power to be shown. I never really liked the way I looked. You know, I just wanted to look good. I'd trained two and a quarter hours back then, pushing heavy all the way, dressed only uh, a minute in between sets. My reps were around six reps. I deadlift 650 pounds. I bench press uh, over 400 pounds on, uh, on a bench press. Then I was big. I was about 92, 93 kilos. I had a mental goal, a personal journey that everything I do has to increase every day at all costs. For example, whatever I'm lifting that day, I come in the next day, I try and lift that just a little bit more. I always kept it a little bit more. Now at the time, I didn't realise I was really getting big. See, the first motivation in my head was to get strong and just get powerful. The size just kept coming on because uh, as I pushed more, I got hungrier. I was following the original Franco Colombo and Arnold program, they both did together, but I discovered it wasn't their program either. It originally came from Reg Park. I made sure that the program covered every part of my body, so I did a bit of study. I, I wanted no weak point in my body. Uh, guys in the gym kept asking me, Rock, why don't, you, why don't you go in a show? You know, you're thick and you're big enough. You should go in a show, you'd have a good shot at it. And I go, oh yeah, must well go in, it could be fun. I've got to, got to be honest, I love showing off. <laughs> and I figured if I've got something to show, why not show it off? That was a thrill. They go, well, you've got a diet. And I wasn't ready to diet back then. And I said, oh, can I go in for fun? And they go, oh, yeah, you might do well. Oh, we'll give it a shot. So, uh, yeah, I went in two shows. I didn't diet. And I didn't win. <laughs> but for fun, and I enjoyed it. Then I went in a third one. And I, I got second. I didn't enjoy getting second, but I took it well. I took it well, and I got well. The only way to win is to get better and better. And I just kept improving every month. My muscles were getting thicker, better. I was getting stronger. Then I went in the uh, Novice Victoria, and I won the Novice Victoria. And then I made such an incredible improvement from the Victoria to the 1976 Mr. Australia that everyone goes, oh, rock, you know, Jesus, you know, you should go for the Australia. And I said, well, I'd like to win a Victoria first. And they go, oh, no, I go straight to the Australia. So I did. To win, you really had to be good. Everyone was good. You couldn't have a fault. You know, if you had, like, no calves. Like today, I see people with no calves and they're running home with big, massive titles, you know? Back then, you had to have everything. You had to be symmetrical. You know, you had to be shapely. And the most important back then is you had to have dimensional muscle, thick, dense muscle. And I won the Mr. Australia and I won the uh, most muscular award, best ab award. And yeah, I was, I was quite happy.